for our very first event. This is the inaugural SCORE A Better Future event. And I'm Joanne Gaskin, and I work on the FICO SCORES team. And I've been with FICO for a little bit over 10 years, and I have to say this is one of the more exciting initiatives that we've undertaken. We care deeply about financial inclusion um, through in consumer empowerment, and I think that this event is, we're very excited to be launching it with a number of fantastic partners. So I would like to take just a few moments to uh, thank some of our partners who are with us tonight to help us succeed in our mission of financial empowerment through financial literacy. So first, I would like to thank Harris Stowe for um, hosting us. Isn't this a fantastic facility? And I'd also really like to extend a warm welcome to Sherry Faulkner, who's down here in front. Wave to everyone, Sherry. Okay. She's the Director of Community Affairs for the Office of Congressional uh, Member Lacey Clay. Now, Congressman Clay has represented the 1st District since 2001, and he's a senior member on the House Financial Services Committee, and he has dedicated his life to financial empowerment and financial literacy. And so it's really, I think, fitting that we're hosting this event today in a building named after his father. Amazing, right? So Congressman Clay was unable to come today, but he was gracious enough to um, do a welcoming video for us. And so I'd like to share that video with everybody right now. Good evening. I wish I could be back home tonight to kick off the Score a Better Future tour with you, but duty calls back here in Washington. I'm so pleased that St. Louis is the first city selected for the Score a Better Future event. I want to thank FICO for presenting this tremendous program to provide you with FICO score education and an opportunity to receive help from local credit counselors who can help you improve your financial health. As a senior member of the House Financial Services Committee and the Financial and Economic Literacy Caucus, I strongly believe that financial literacy is a vital life skill. Tonight, all of you have a real chance to take positive steps towards building a stronger financial future. Thank you to all of the exceptional local partners who are making this powerful program possible. Most importantly, I want to thank all of you for being here. Good luck tonight. Have a wonderful holiday season. And may God bless you and your family. Isn't that fantastic? So gracious of him to do that for us. And so I'd also like to recognize some of our other fantastic local partners that are in the room. So uh, first, Justine Peterson. Oh, I see my Justine Peterson friends there. Yes, thank you. The St. Louis Regional Task Force of the Unbanked as well. There we go. Yeah, thank you. The St. Louis Treasurer's Office of Financial Empowerment. Oh, there you are. Yes, okay, great. So all of these partners have come together to help us bring life to this event, and we're very grateful to be able to be partnered with them. So we do have an initial, another special treat in that the Treasurer's Office also uh, did a video for us welcoming folks to this event. And so I'm going to ask that our good friend Lisa Gates come down to make an introduction of that video. Thank you, Lisa. Good evening, everyone. My name is Lisa Gates, and I am the director of the City of St. Louis Treasurer's Office of Financial Empowerment. I want to thank you for coming out tonight to be part of FICO's SCORE, A Better Future event. St. Louis is the first stop for FICO as they get ready to take the SCORE, A Better Future program nationally. This new program is designed to provide people with the resources they need to make better choices with their money. Their mission supports the mission of the Office of Financial Empowerment, so I'm proud that we could team up together to bring SCORE a better future to St. Louis. Unfortunately, Treasurer Jones could not be with us tonight, but she has provided a recorded message for you. So without further ado, here is the treasurer of the city of St. Louis, Tashara Jones. 
Good evening. I'm Tashara Jones and I'm treasurer of the city of St. Louis. I'm sorry that I couldn't be with you this evening, but I wanted to take a moment to welcome you and say thank you for attending SCORE A Better Future. As some of you may know, I created the city's first office of financial empowerment. I did this because I believe that government should work for the people, not the other way around. So does FICO and Justine Peterson, which is why we teamed up to bring this event to you. My good friend John Hope Bryant once said, and it's true, nothing changes your life more than love, God, or a 100-point increase in your credit score. Your credit score controls your economic mobility, how much you pay for everything, and sometimes what kind of job you get. So take a few moments tonight and think about what you need to get on the path to a better financial future. We're here to help. Thank you for coming. Enjoy the evening, and may God bless all of you during the holiday season. Also supporting today's event is uh, Lisa Potts from uh, Bank On, the National Consumers League, and St. Louis American. So we'll be thrilled to work with all these fantastic organizations and be here with you today. So tonight you're going to get access to your FICO score freely along with one-on-one -on -one credit and financial counseling delivered by Justine Peterson and customized plans to help you reach your personal financial goals. I'd also like to now introduce my colleague Tom Quinn who's going to review how FICO scores work with you. As Tom comes up, I'd like to draw to your attention, sitting in front of you, there's a postcard. And if you flip it over, there's a handful of questions on the back. And we'd like to ask if you would please just take a few moments, answer the questions to the best of your ability. At the end of the program, I'm going to be in the back collecting these. And for those of you who participate, your cards are going to go into a drawing to win an Echo Dot. So I hope that you participate in the fun with us. And I hope that you find that this program is informational and helpful as you plan your financial future. So with that, Tom, thank you. So I'm glad Joanne did not say that the prize would be a 100 point increase in your FICO score. Because <laughs> we don't have the power to do that, but everyone in this room does have the power to do that with your own FICO score. Um, so, uh, as Joanne mentioned, I work in the scoring group at FICO. I've been with FICO for over 20 years in the scoring department. I built the model, so I kind of know the secret sauce. But uh, the good news is there really is no secret sauce. And what we're hoping to do through this program is help consumers understand that they have control over their credit future and their financial health, and um, that leads to more financial options for you to as you you know buy and purchase things in your in your um, daily life. So we had a couple of quiz questions for you, and I know that some of you are taking them right now, but we'll kind of go do this by a show of hands. So, uh, do you feel that this statement is true? Missing a few payments now and then is okay and won't have much impact on your score. How many people think that's true? Uh, you're just moving your hair. Okay. <laughs> Good, because it's false. That's right. So making payments on time is one of the most crucial items that the FICO score is evaluating. Um, how many of you think that deferred student loans are bypassed by the FICO score? True or false? How many people think that's false? That's right. So the student loan, even though it's in a deferred status and that has benefits to you to not have to pay the note, is still reported on your credit report. And the time that the student loan has been on the credit report or date open, et cetera, is all factoring into the score. Um, how many of you feel that when you get married, your credit profile is merged with your spouse's credit profile and you have one single profile? That's false, exactly. So we all, most of us have individual credit reports and then when we get married, we retain our individual profile in the credit reporting database. But as we go forward with our, our partner and have joint credit, it gets reported to both your credit and your spouse's credit report. Um, true or false, a hard inquiry can lower your score. True, very good. So a hard inquiry is when you have proactively go to a lender and say, I'm applying for credit, or if you call up your credit card issuer and say, I'd like to get a line increase, it's where you're proactively seeking credit, and that's coded in a way that we can identify it's a hard inquiry, and that could have impact on your score. Uh, income, if you make a lot of money, you have a great FICO score. True, false? 
Falls. That's right. So uh, as I said, I've been with FICO for 20 years, and I used to manage our customer care call department. And one time I, a call was escalated to me, and it was a, a lawyer who was trying to close on his house that day, and his score wasn't very good. And he kept telling me, I make a lot of money. I make $400,000 a year in money in law as a lawyer. And I said, well, the only advice I can give you is start taking some of that money and paying your credit card bills on time. So the good news is if you're not a rich person, you can still have a, a great score. Um, closing unused credit cards will improve if FICO score. True, false? False, that's right. So closing inactive credit accounts do not have a positive impact on the score, and they potentially can have a negative impact. And I can explain that at a different uh, after the seminar. And then true or false, your FICO scores may be different across the three credit bureaus. True, that's right. So even though most of the reporting in today's uh, environment is automated and electronic and your information is similar across the credit reporting agencies, um, there can be differences in the way it's stored, et cetera, which can cause the score to be different across Equifax, TransUnion, and Experian. Which of the following purposes are reasonable re reasons why your score could be pulled? Top three? What about Facebook? No. That's right. So. If you go in for an auto loan, applying for an auto loan, um, they're going to most likely pull your credit report, um, credit card application, et cetera. Renting an apartment, commonly a credit report's pulled for that as well. But at least to date, Facebook has not had access to your credit score and credit okay, report. So Pardon me? Yes, renting apartment, they often do. And then which items will impact your FICO scores? Missing an auto payment, true? Applying for credit? Bouncing a check? False. So your management of your, your checking account, your DDA information, is not reported to the, regular, the three national credit reporting agencies. So for the FICO scores derived off of the national reporting information, bounce check would not impact your FICO score because it's not reported to the Bureau. So is bounce check? What that difference? The bounce check does not impact your FICO score. That's false. And then high credit card balances can impact your score. So based on this conversation, a lot of you already know a lot about FICO scores, so that's good, and hopefully we'll be able to share some more information to, to make it even more, more transparent. So we're going to spend about 20 or 30 minutes just going over some basics about scoring. Um, what I'd like to do is allow me to get through the presentation, and then I'll be available afterwards for any questions that you have regarding FICO scores or credit reporting, lending practices, et cetera. So there's a lot of parties involved in this whole credit ecosystem we have out here. So there's the consumers, us, right? So we're out there, we're applying for credit. Once we get the credit, we're making payments to the lenders, um, and then we're hopefully making payments to the lenders, and we're utilizing that credit, the credit card, especially holiday season coming up, shopping, buying stuff. And then we're accessing our credit scores and credit reports, and there's different ways you can access them um, out there. And then we have the lenders. So the lenders are um, uh, trying to extend you credit. They're also um, working with you to make sure that you make payments on time. And they're reporting your activity to the credit reporting agencies. And they're also getting information from the credit reporting agencies to, to make uh, credit decisions on you. And some of them are providing your FICO score for free on credit card statements. So if you have like a Citibank credit card or Wells Fargo credit card on your online statement, you can see your FICO score. And then there's the credit reporting agencies. So TransUnion, Experian, Equifax are the three primary credit reporting agencies. They're collecting information from lenders on how you're paying your bills on time from courts and public records, et cetera. And at the same time, they're also providing that information back to the lenders when you apply for credit uh, so the, credit, the lender can make an informed credit decision. 
And then there's FICO. So FICO is not a credit reporting agency or a credit bureau. We're a company that works with the bureaus, and we design the algorithm or the mathematical formula that calculates the score based on the information in your credit report. And so we also offer those credit FICO scores to consumers through some of our own um, personal sites as well. So where can you get your FICO score? So there's a couple places. Well, one is myfico.com is a website that FICO owns and makes uh, available to consumers to get their FICO score. Um, you can also get it through uh, FICO scores through open access partners, such as I said, um, Citibank, Wells Fargo, lots of credit card issuers are providing them on their statements. Um, through credit counseling agencies, such as Justin Peterson, that will have availability to get your score today. Uh, and then through regulatory disclosure. So if you've ever, if you've bought a house recently, the lender will usually provide a, a, a note to you saying that they use FICO scores as part of that decision process and provide it to you. Or if you've been denied credit in an adverse action notice, that'll be provided. So there's a lot of different places where you can get a FICO score. So the important thing is to just know that if it doesn't say FICO score, it's probably not a FICO score. So if you go to sites like creditkarma.com, uh, Credit Sesame, et cetera, they're offering scores, but they're not FICO scores. So we have uh, strict requirements that if, a, if an entity is distributing a FICO score, it has to say FICO score. So that's how you can tell that it's, it's a FICO score. And the FICO score is basically derived off of the credit report information, and we kind of break it into five categories. And so the first category, your personal information, um, that's not factored into the score at all. But then we're looking at public records. So if you filed bankruptcy, that would be obviously a, a, an in indicator of risk and have an effect on your score. Collection items, so that means you had some credit that you didn't pay and it went to a charged off status and then collections. And then the meat of the score is based on your account information, credit cards, mortgages, personal loans, student loans, auto loans, et cetera. And then inquiries. So inquiries, again, we're only looking at hard inquiries where you are applying for credit, not for what's called soft inquiries, where you pulled your own credit report or you got a pre-approved credit card offer in the mail. So what are scores designed to do? They're designed to rank order risk. And that sounds kind of mathematical, but basically what that's saying is a lender looks at this almost like a Las Vegas question. So on a given day, a bank, let's say, has 1,000 applicants to come in for credit, and they need to extend credit to them. And so scoring helps them make that decision more quickly because they have odds associated with whether someone's going to pay as agreed or not in the, across the score range. And what the score does is it's people who score higher, you're going to get more good guys, so the guys in the green, versus the one guy who's going to write off on that. So, what the score is trying to do is push low risk people to the high part of the score, 300 to 850 is the range, 850 is lowest credit risk, 300 is highest credit risk, and push the people who are riskier to the lower part of the scale. And then the lender chooses and determines which of those cutoffs are going to make most sense for their book of business. Not everybody has a FICO score. Um, there's some minimum score criteria required. So we need to have at least one credit account that's been open for six months or greater and has been reported or updated in the last six months. So you could have a Sears credit card that was open 10 months ago that reported being used last month and you would be eligible to get a FICO score. On the same throne, you could have 10 credit accounts in your credit report and let's say you've been very credit inactive in the last year or two and not get a score because there's no recent activity or recent update on your credit report. So it's important that um, you have at least one trade that's been in existence for a little bit, six months, and you have some activity being reported to the Bureau on at least one credit obligation. Um, if you're deceased or you have a deceased indicator, you won't get a score. So we, we don't score dead people. So what are the things we're looking at? So again, we're looking at trade lines, which are your credit accounts, your inquiries, collections, public records, uh, et cetera. Things that are not looked at in the score, we don't look at your age, we don't look at the zip code where you live, we don't look at income, we don't look at gender, 
We don't look at religious affiliation. So any of the factors that are prohibited by the ECOA are not included in the score. So we're really focused exclusively on that credit report information in your credit bureau. So if you've ever pulled your credit report, sometimes you'll see that they do have information that will say your income is X or you've been at this employer for X number of years. And so even though that's in the credit report, we find that it's not updated or verified, so we don't use it. So again, we're only looking at that kind of raw credit report information about how you're managing your debt and opening up new credit. So when we're uh, building a FICO score or calculating a FICO score, we're looking at five predictive elements of the score. We're looking at how your payment history is. We're looking at your amount of debt. We're looking at your length of credit history. We're looking at your pursuit of new credit. And we're looking at your credit mix. So those five kind of slices of the pie, if you add them up, they are what compromise your FICO score. And so we're going to take a minute and kind of go into each piece of the pie and look at a little bit more information. So if your brother or your cousin or your sister came to you today and said, I need $5,000. Can you loan me $5,000? What are some questions that would pop into your mind? Right. <laughs> so things you're going to think are like, have I ever borrowed loan money to my brother, sister, cousin before? No, not $5,000. Did they pay me back? <laughs> or even if it's, let's say, 100 Did they pay me back? How many times have they asked me for credit in the past? You know, so these are some common questions you would think before you loan your own money to someone. And the score is kind of doing the same thing, only it's doing it mathematically. So it's asking a bunch of questions of the credit report information and getting answers back. And then statistically, we assign points to that to come up with that overall score. So when we're looking at payment history, we're looking at it in three different ways. We're looking at the severity, the recency, and the frequency. So what do we mean by that? So severity. Was it a one-time 30-day late, or is it a charge-off or bankruptcy? So the more severe the, the, the late payment information is, the harder it's going to hit. Then we're looking at frequency. So is it the one-time missed payment, dog ate my bill, I couldn't find it, and I didn't mail it in? Or is there a pattern where we're seeing late payments on credit cards, on auto loans, on retail cards? So frequency comes into play. And then we're looking at. Um, Recency. So how recent is it? So that recency is really predictive. If someone has, if you look at the two credit reports and they both have a 60-day pass due in their history and someone, person A had it last month and person B had it five years ago, if everything else is held constant in the credit report, that person that had it more recently is going to get harder hit because it's indicative of more recent behavior. So for payment history, again, we're looking at the frequency, the recency, and severity. So outstanding debt. We don't have income information, but we're looking here at credit balances and how you're using your credit. So things here would be what, how many balances, what's your total balances on credit cards? How many credit cards do you have with a balance? So that balance information is predictive. How many, what's your balance on your installment loans, like a car loan? But what's more predictive is how much of your available credit is being used. So if you look at your credit card statement, and let's say you have a $1,000 balance on your credit card statement, but you have um, $4,000 available credit to you, you're 25% utilized. So you're using 25% of your available credit. So the higher that ratio becomes, if you're like getting up in 75%, 85%, et cetera, the harder the hit's going to be on the score. So I've often had customers or consumers question me about this. They're like, I don't know why my score is in the low 600s. I've never missed a payment. And the news there is, yes, you're doing a great job of making payments on time, but you owe $80,000 of credit on your credit cards, and you have $100,000 available to you, so you're 80% utilized. So that utilization of available credit is really important and predictive. 
length of credit history comes up next. And so what we're looking at here is um, how long you've had credit. So if you think like a, a banker, right, you go in to apply for credit and let's say you're 18 years old, just out of school, and you don't have any credit history or you have very limited credit history versus someone who's 38 years old applying for that same credit and has had credit for 20 years. So what that length of history is doing is the longer your length of credit history, the more points you're going to get on average. And we don't look at it just in terms of your age of oldest account, but we look at the average age. So if you've opened up a lot of new accounts in the recent past, that's going to pull down the score. So length of credit history is important, but the two most critical factors of the score are the payment history and the amounts owed. On credit history too, let's talk about new pursuit of new credit. So um, if you've opened up a lot of new credit recently, that's going to have an, a, an impact on your score because the score is saying, hey, this person's opened up a lot of new credit recently, they say two, three, four trade lines, and they haven't shown yet that they can manage that credit effectively. So as time progresses and you show that you're able to manage that new credit you brought on, it will have less of an impact. And then inquiries also play a factor here. So how many uh, times have you applied for credit in the last year? But at the grand scheme of things, inquiries don't drive the score. They just cost you know, several points here and there for the most part. And then the uh, fifth credit factor is your credit mix. So this is looking at how much credit you have in terms of do you have installment credit, so such as a car loan or a personal loan or a student loan, revolving credit such as credit cards or department store cards, home equity lines of credit, mortgages. And so what we like to see or what the data tells us is that the consumers that have a wider range of different types of credit that they've managed successfully uh, convert to um, better or more points. So in summary, if you think about what's driving the score, we're looking at payment history. That represents about 35% of the score. Your amounts owed or your level of debt, which amounts for about 30% of the score. Your length of credit history, which accounts for about 15% of your score. Your pursuit of new credit, so inquiries, opening new accounts, accounts for about 10% of your score. And then your mix of credit, which accounts for about 10% of your score. So you can tell that how you manage your credit, how you pay your bills on time, and you, how you manage your debt, keeping your debt levels low, that's really what's driving the scores. 65% of the scores coming from those two you know, categories of information. And having a good score has real benefits to us as consumers. It allows you to have access to more affordable credit at better interest rates. And this is an example of a, of a, a auto loan, so a three-year auto loan. Let's say you're going out for, to get a new car. You're going to finance $20,000 of that car. And if you had a FICO score in the 550 range, you would spend over the life of that loan $25,668 in payments. If you had a FICO score in the mid-700s, you would save almost $4,500 off the life of that loan. So again, if you have higher scores, it translates into economic benefits and allows you more uh, access to your capital to do other things. So this is an example of a, a consumer. It's a, it's a test consumer. It's not a real consumer who has a score of 680. So 680 is kind of a, a good score. It's a score that most lenders would seem to find somewhat acceptable. It's kind of right on the margin of a cutoff. And so one of the things that you want to know when you see that score is like, well, what's driving that? Where am I missing the most points? So. Um, Score factors are generated with each score to help explain why the score is not higher. So in this case, we have some red factors here saying that some of the key areas that are driving that score to be lower are that there's a presence of delinquency on the credit report. Um, they, uh, 
which was a serious delinquency, so a charge off our collection. And they've missed payments on their credit accounts recently, so maybe a 30 day, 60 day past due. And they made heavy use of their available credit. So they're, they're using their credit cards. And then on the positive side, so they're also doing some things good, is that they have a lengthy established credit history. So on the green are things they're doing well, the reds are things that they're potentially challenged with. Um, they're using their credit and they have many accounts that are in good standing. So when you get access to your FICO score, like this evening if you work with uh, Justin Peterson, um, some of these reasons will be provided and shared with you to help you understand why your score, what it is, and what's the main reasons why that score is not higher. And so that provides a great opportunity to provide some transparency into your own score in terms of what's going on to help you understand where you need to focus to increase it. And then on my FICO, we have a simulator tool. That allows you to play what if scenarios to help you understand if I did this, what potentially could be the future impact on my FICO score. So in this case, again, it's kind of interesting. Just the passage of time is going to have positive impact on score. So in this case, let's say we want to see what will the score be if they pay my bills on time for the next six months. So in this case, we see that the score potential increases 35 points. And that's just from paying bills on time for the next six months and keeping your balances, at, you know, not charging anymore and keeping your balances as is. So information is aging. Your inquiries, your delinquencies, your age of oldest trade, et cetera, is aging in six months and it's having that positive dynamic on the score. You can also look at what impact would paying down revolving balances have. So in this particular profile, there are more opportunity for point increase from letting the account age and, oh, sorry about that. Um, and also the opportunity to reduce balances on your credit cards, which can help to increase points. And if you want to look at it on the more risky side, Anybody, if you file bankruptcy, you can see that's going to be a big hit on your score, or if you forget to pay a bill, that has a fairly substantial negative impact on score. So tools like this can help you better understand why your score is where it is, as well as provide the opportunity to create an action plan and get an estimate of how certain actions that you take could have a positive effect on your score. So again, later in the session, uh, if you wanted to interact with one of the counselors, that could be something that um, would be helpful to understand. So those were my planned comments. Um, I'll open it up just for a couple questions, and then um, if there's more questions than that, I, I can take those you know, outside after the, the event. Yes? Right, okay. So the question is, when you sign up for monitoring solutions that are promoted heavily on the internet, uh, what score are you getting? So with Experian, so Experian.com, their credit tracker, et cetera, and credit works, it actually is a FICO score. So we have a relationship with Experian where they're distributing FICO scores. Um, but other entities such as Credit Karma, or Credit Sesame as examples are not distributing FICO scores. So the the way to know that it's a FICO score is that it has to say a FICO score. So a lot of times it'll just say credit score or in the fine print at the bottom it'll say this is an educational score or this is a vantage score. So in order so for...
if it doesn't work, I can repeat the question. So, uh, how are those scores? Are they are they off by a lot, or uh, or is it just a few points? I realize they're they use, they're using different algorithms. I'm I'm thinking uh, to come up with a score. I guess my my question is why do you have to ha why do you need a, a credit karma score? Why are they giving you that score if it's not going to be a realistic score? You follow me? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I really follow you. We wonder the same thing, right? But, because uh, so because FICO is, FICO is is actually the the most used scoring model, correct? Those are the that's what the car dealers, if you go get a mortgage, all of that, they're looking at a FICO score, right? Right. So over ninety percent of the credit transactions in the United States are using a FICO score. FICO. Okay. So um, in terms of the difference between FICO score and an educational score or Vantage score. Um, it could be drastically different. I've seen cases where it's 50, 60 points different, even though it's on the same data. Um, or it could be relatively close. But even if it's close, that has meaning and a disadvantage to consumers potentially. Because let's say that the Vantage score and the FICO score are close to 680. And Vantage says it's 682, but FICO says it's 671. And that happens to be the lender's cutoff of 680. So you would go in there saying, I'm going to get this credit because I have a 682 score that I saw at Credit Karma. But the lender's pulling a FICO score, and it's showing 670. And you don't get it because that's below the cutoff. So while there's often examples of magnitude being great between the scores, even when they're close, that has risks to the consumer being misleading. So why is it that when, when, you, when you go apply for a mortgage, uh, they look at all three of the services. So they look at Experian, they look at Equifax, and they look at TransUnion. So why is it that if they're using FICO as their source, their credit modeling source, why is it that those companies will give you different numbers? Why won't the numbers just be the same if they're, both, if they're all using FICO? So in the mortgage industry, you're correct. They use, they pull three bureaus for that credit evaluation. And... Um, the scores can be different for a variety of reasons between the three bureaus. Most of the time, it's because the data on the bureau is different across the three. But it could be other reasons, like they were pulled at a different time, or um, the algorithms could be a little bit different and tailored to each bureau. But it's usually because the information is in. Okay. All right. That makes sense. Thank you. Sure. So my question is, how long do negative reports remain on your credit history? Um, how long does, do they fall off? Or do you have to remove them? How does all that work? Right. So with negative information, as a, by law, they're supposed to fall off after seven years. Some versions of bank, some bankruptcies, and I can't remember if chapter 7 or 13, stay on for 10 years. But most like charge-offs or mispayment information is required to be purged from the credit report at, after seven years. So um, if you have negative information on your credit report, the way the score looks at it is it evaluates that it's there, so the frequency or presence of, but it also looks at the recency. So uh, it's kind of like a thermometer in the summer when the heat of the day starts to get cooler at night. As that delinquency ages, and your new credit performance shows you're paying on time, it has less and less of an impact on score. But once it reaches that seven year period, by rule, the bureaus are supposed to purge that off the credit report. Thanks, Tom. How about one more? If you have debt and you wanted to contact the lender, how long does it take for them to remove um, for them to remove whatever you have on your credit um, off while making payments? Like if you, like you called them today and made agreements to set up payment arrangements, do they remove it instantly or um, do you have to wait until the report circles again for it to be um, saying, shows that you're making payments towards um, your debt? So, I'll answer that in two ways to make sure I understood the question. So um, you're, not, you're not talking about disputing information, are you? I can hardly hear you. 
I said, are you talking about disputing something that's inaccurate on your trip? Yes. Okay. Well, so, not not necessarily disputing, because um, disputing would be um, just basically saying that you don't want to, I guess you're trying to get past not paying them. This is not a dispute. This is basically saying, okay, yeah, I did um, agree to that. I, I did have that item, and I want to pay you all back. Like, But while paying, I, I don't want it to be seen. How um, how long will I have to wait until um, it or when when I when I agree to make payments do they remove it right away or do I have to wait to maybe months later to um, for it to show that payments is being made or you know right so this may be a good question for Justine Peterson uh, the counselors but typically my understanding is let's say that you've been missing payments with your credit card issuer and now you're trying to set up a partial payment plan yeah that historical delinquency let's say you were late 12 months ago and eight months ago that will still be reported on your credit report because it's valid and accurate and it happened but then when you go into like a payment plan with them they'll often put report that account with a, a narrative code that says included in partial payment plan so that information is reported once you've reached that agreement with the lender, but it doesn't remove your past dues that happened in the past, is, is my experience. Okay, and, and you said something about disputing. So if I were to dispute it, will it be removed immediately, or I will have to wait until I get a... Um, so when you, Right, when you dispute something, the bureaus by law have 30 days to investigate and resolve. So typically what happens is you either dispute through the bureau or you dispute through the lender or you do both at the same time. And you only have to do one bureau because they have a system that shares that information across the three bureaus collectively. And so the bureaus then have 30 days to investigate that, dis that dispute that you've listed with the client or the lender and then they make a determination if that dispute's valid or not. So that has to be done within 30 days. And sometimes they'll rule that your dispute's valid, the information was inaccurately reported, and they'll remove it. Other times they'll say, the lender will say, no, that's valid, and the, the person did miss that payment or whatever, and they'll keep that information on the credit report. But they have to do it within 30 days. Um, what, what, what is the best way to dispute? Well, the best way to dispute is to get a copy of your credit report. You can get a free copy at annualcreditreport.com, or tonight you can work with one of the, the counselors. And then once you get that credit report, they have, the bureaus have a process that you would follow you know, on the credit report, either manually through snail mail or online, where you list the items that you want to dispute, and then they receive that information and that starts the process for when they have to get that resolved in 30 days.